his computer. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to another interview on my ruminations about ableism channel. And uh, if you are interested in finding out and listening to other interviews, please click the subscribe button and even better, press the notifications button. And then you'll get notifications of new videos that are uploaded in your inbox, which is great. And today I'm so excited because I'm interviewing a dear friend and colleague, Debbie Foster. So this is just really ter terrific. Now, Debbie is a professor of employment relations and diversity at the Cardiff Bus Business School, part of Cardiff University, which is in Wales in the UK. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you, lovely to be here. Great, and I'm just, um, so let's, let's uh, I, just in terms of like your own background and um, I guess the context of your of your work. I'm really interested in the titles that people uh, um, uh, get known as in terms of their professorships. At some universities, you can choose the titles, and other universities, you can't. So, as I said, Professor of Employment and Relations and Diversity. Tell us about that title and um, what it um, involves. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a bit of a made up title on my part, so I chose it, um, and I. I was in what was a, a human resource management section within a business school and as a collective group we didn't really like the term human resource management because we thought it had certain managerial connotations so um, we, could, we changed it to management and organisation group or MEO it's called, uh, management employment and organisations and quite a lot of us sort of called ourselves employment relations scholars, right. lecturer, senior lecturer, whatever. And I just, when I got my professorship, I just felt that there was nobody representing diversity within our section. And so chose employment relations and diversity. And within that, I just didn't want to say relations and disability, I suppose, but I, I just thought that I was interested in intersectional issues as well. And um, I, I was also interested in trying to reflect diversity more within the curriculum in business schools because yeah. business schools can be very managerialist. Cardiff isn't one of those types of business schools. It's much more uh, a kind of socio sociologically orientated business school yeah. um, than a management uh, type business school. And I wanted that to be reflected in my title I suppose. Yeah no it's a great title and I think the titles are you know actually important as naming practices I think um, the fact that you know um, diversity is included in that is actually quite politically significant I know I went through that myself when I was looking at my um, own professorship and disability and um, ableism studies was how to capture that and have it broad without it being limited so I think um, that's great and I guess you just when you were talking then you picked up on another important issue because you're actually a sociologist by training I understand. Yeah yeah my background is sociology I did sociology at Lancaster University back in the day and then oh, went to very Washington. famous sociology school yeah yes yeah <laughs> great experience Lancaster was and then went on to do a PhD at Bath Uni in uh, sort of specializing in sociology of work and employment but, but I mean, I've, I've moved quite a long way from where I was then. Then I was doing work on, my PhD was work on privatisation and public sector trade unions. Right. Um, so it's a long way from where I am now. But yeah. It's really the lived experience of having been disabled myself uh, for and having had a long-term illness, um, which, you know, resulted in me being bedridden for a couple of years that my whole perspective changed because you know, I got to do a crash course in legal rights and other employment rights around disability being on sick leave for two years yeah. uh, you sort of end up doing your own crash course on this. Well that's often, um, uh, that's often the, what, the, the case isn't it because um, often when I you know speak to PhD students or others and they kind of are very interested in our our career journeys, our personal journeys, our academic journals journeys. That there's often twists and turns, and I think that's the nice thing about it. Actually, there's unexpected and um, 
you know, your, your, your research changes over time. I, I think the point that you've made is the lived experience. I mean, we often don't talk about that as much as we should. I mean, we are embodied yeah. people, we're embodied women, um, and surely our lived experience filters into our change perspective and research. And I think the other thing is these days, and um, and I think it's great as a sociologist that you are in the business school, is I think there is a recognition that um, interdisciplinarity is really yeah. important. And you know yourself, we often bring in other fields of knowledge and research yeah. as well. So, so in terms of, I mean, today we're going to talk about um, disabled lawyers, but before we jump into that, I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the kind of disability research that you did before that project came along. Yeah, um, I, I, when I returned to work in 2000, um, I put in for an ESRC small grant to do some work into how, how do you negotiate reasonable justice in the workplace? Because yeah. it seemed to me that there was a whole body of law there saying that you were entitled to reasonable adjustments, but nobody was really looking at it analytically from an employment relations perspective, because negotiating reasonable adjustments actually often results in changing all your terms and conditions of employment. Yes. And as we know, employers aren't very happy about changing standard terms and conditions of employment. And yet individuals were being expected to do this alone. Trade unions at that time really weren't doing a lot of representation of employees in the workplace. So that sort of fed into my interest in trade unions. So I, 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 I put in for a grant, just a small grant, to interview 20 people about their experiences of negotiating reasonable adjustments in the workplace and their experiences of um, engaging with trade unions, which then I could feed into the employment relations and industrial relations kind of field within the business yeah. Um, school. Yeah, and I think but that's really, really vital. Can I just jump in there, Debbie, and say because Firstly, I guess two things. I was at a seminar yesterday and we again discussed reasonable adjustment and said that we needed to look at um, uh, the gap between policy and practice, what's really happening. Yeah. I don't think there's still an, enough work on this and to look at, and this was to do with universities, this seminar. So to even look yeah. at how reasonable adjustment is, is developed as a policy directive within each university, because I think there's lots of uh, misunderstandings. But I think the point that you're saying is uh, there's different prisms that you can look at this and actually, um, it's good to get some clear you know, cross-cutting research around the employment relations perspective because yeah. uh, the way they view it in terms of the corporate power dynamics might be quite different, for example, from disabled employees per se coming yeah. in. So, and I think it, it gets reduced to a very individualised process yeah. um, of you trying to negotiate because it becomes medicalised. So yeah, exactly, says, exactly. Your employer says you need an occupational health assessment and then that triggers the idea that they'll talk about adjusting your your work yeah um that becomes something that's very individualized because straight away it, it's privatized yeah um anything that's medical employers immediately go well that's a private issue you know we can't have a wider um sort of discussion about this but what i was interested in was ways of collectivizing the experiences that people have when they negotiate reasonable adjustments. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed to me that trade unions weren't very good at that. No. So, so trade union representatives had individualized experiences of attending meetings with people who were negotiating reasonable adjustments. But no one was collecting knowledge yeah. from these different encounters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it seemed that that suited, I hate to say it, but it suits HR. Because on, on the whole, employers aren't, aren't very keen on making adjustments. No, well, if you're right. Conditions. Yeah, you're right. Because actually, it's, a, it's a, I mean, that's been my frustration. I'm a true believer in, in anti-discrimination law. But one of the problems about anti-discrimination law, uh, at least in the UK and Australia, is it's very much a case-by-case uh, -case basis. So you can have yeah. the same issue going on over and over. And there's been... Um, 
uh, and because of that, for example, the data collection doesn't look at patterns or commonalities, um, you know, and look at systemic issues. Um, I think the, and again, I was talking about this yesterday because I, uh, uh, when I was in Australia and I'd heard about the Equalities um, Act, I was thought, wow, this is a really radical piece of, <laughs> of legislation. <laughs> I'm a bit, bit, bit kind of like rose-coloured glasses at the time. But the bit that I was interested in was the, um, the anticipatory. Yeah. Uh, reasonable adjustment duties yeah and i think uh, i mean that's interesting because then it sees our uh, disabled people as a class you know so yeah. it's uh and, and i think it's been very underutilized but that's probably more um a discussion for a, for another talk that we can do which would be <laughs> which would be great <laughs> because because i think it's about keeping the whole uh reasonable adjustment um advocacy on the research agenda on the public agenda yeah and I, I do think that the original Equality Act, when it was first um, being debated, some of the original input into the Equality Act did have a vision, because it was under the Labour government at the time, it did have a vision of a more collective way of viewing equality. So there was, there was also um, an emphasis on socioeconomic background, which actually was removed from the Act when the Conservatives came into power here about you know um having to look at um, different people's the origins of uh different people's socioeconomic background and also in in employment tribunals in the originally employment tribunals could advise employers um after a tribunal about what they should do in terms of the practice and that's really important because you could have got case law accumulating with lots of advice going to employers that other employers would then feel that they were obligated to follow. Actually, the Conservatives got rid of that as well. Yeah, that would have been really uh, important, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were really important and radical aspects yeah, of the law yeah. that, that actually got taken out. Yeah, and we need to... Um... I mean, we need to talk about that more because I think one of the challenges, particularly with the disability rights movement, but also the disability research community is that loss of cultural memory. I think yeah. uh, just even you sharing that today is um, is quite significant. Well, let's move on to the issue of um, disabled lawyers. Now, I'm really interested in this because I don't know uh, whether I've shared this with you. So I actually, um, my my first degree was in a law school uh, and um, uh, I, uh, I I did with a um, I, I finished a now redundant degree. It's fin it, they they shut it down. A bachelor of legal studies with honours, but at the same time I am um, also enrolled in an LLB um, and did uh, two and a half years. Uh, I always did this part time and um and, 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 well, you could, I was going to say unfortunately, but actually it could have been seen as a positive thing. I was actually um. Uh, offered a PhD scholarship <laughs> because I did so well in my honours thesis and um, and I had never studied full time so it was like a dream come true so I um, actually uh, withdrew from the um, from the LLB program so I I, I always say I, I, I could next life I'm going to be a lawyer next life because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I do lots of legal research and and but what I remember at the time was and you know this was obviously two decades ago or so uh, um, is that law is really interesting because it, it has been uh, a, 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 the bastion of privilege um, mm -hmm. and um, I can only talk about it in the Australian context but I imagine it's similar elsewhere anyway I mean it really was um, a lot of resistance to even opening up law schools to women um, yeah. that that's changed in fact in Australia I think probably in some universities uh, women are a majority of law students yeah. in fact. Uh, um, uh, but at the same time I was aware and probably that's why I decided to go for the PhD because I wasn't well connected was at the end of the day to get your articles you know to, to get in to the right law firm you had to have connections so it was the old system of patronage and yeah. some, some people had already you know had conversations with an uncle that they hadn't spoke of spoken to in 15 years to get that connection to get in so it wasn't a level playing field um and it was very hard as a disabled student myself i think because the law books again this is pre-internet but they were fat and chunky and um just even getting access to them carrying them around and getting yeah. special adjustments so i'm really interested in the project that you that, that you were involved in maybe if you can give us a little bit of a background to the project and then um 
we can talk about the yeah. findings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the project came from um, a nationwide initiative which is called disability research into independent living and learning and it was a really innovative project in the four disability rights organizations disability wales scotland northern ireland and disability rights uk all applied for um, lottery money national lottery money and won five million pounds amazing and the basis of the application was that they felt that they needed lots of evidence-based research about disabled people's lives everything you know from friendships to social care to um, yeah. employment yeah. all aspects of disabled people's lives so this project you know advertised for academics to link up with disabled people's organizations and produce this research co-produce this research in partnership and that really really appealed to me you know the co-production element yeah. of it because of the kind of emancipatory tradition of research within the disability rights movement and so um i got together with somebody called natasha hurst who was at the time a director of disability wales she's also an independent researcher she's a deaf researcher she's um been, she, I first knew her through the she was the equalities officer there um, and we got together and thought we'd like to do a project um, about disabled professionals because it always was that most of the employment research that was around was about getting disabled people into any work just getting them off benefits and not thinking in terms of careers yeah, lowest and common denominator. Yeah, lowest yeah, common denominator. Yeah, lowest common denominator. Yeah. And um, I was aware that the legal profession had done a lot of DNI work, diversity and inclusion work, and um, this had begun in this country, like Australia, back in the sort of late seventies, early eighties, when there was a lot of critiques of the legal profession and its elitism, and a lot of economic background and sort of which school did you come from which university did you come yeah. from and uh, yeah and then there were there was a big explosion in gender research on the legal profession a bit like australia and now we've got the vast majority i think it's now a majority of women um are qualified solicitors in this country so there was a lot of work going on there there was a little bit of work going on on race a little bit on sexuality lgbt plus but it just seemed to me that there'd been all this high profile work because firms had invested in this work as well because they, they wanted to counter the image of elitism. It seemed to me it was not a disability. No, so it's always the great afterthought. That's the problem yeah. with disability. Yeah. yeah. I did a literature review and couldn't find anything. You know, just a couple of things in, in other countries, small studies. There, were, there was a PhD that somebody had done, I think in Australia, actually. Um, which was a very small scale study, uh, but nothing comprehensive. No, it's, it, no it's, it's been it's been nearly uh, fairly neglected. I don't know what the PhD is that you refer to, but I know that a, a friend of mine, Paul Harper, who's a blind man. Well, yeah, Harper, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's um, and he's an academic now in a law school, but uh, you know, I, as I said, I think it's been a very uh, uh, neglected area. Research. Yeah. And it seemed to me that, you know, either either disabled people weren't there and that's why we're not talking about them or people were unexpected. Yeah. And if they were unexpected, what were the sorts of barriers they were facing in the profession? Mm -hmm. if, if we didn't expect them to be there as the general public, surely the profession didn't expect them to be there either. So we, we teamed up with the Lawyers with Disabilities Division of the Law Society, who were the only um, organised group within the legal profession within the UK. And they represent disabled solicitors and paralegals, but there wasn't a, a group at that time that was representing barristers. Right. Um, but, even, but even the existence of that's really fascinating, the fact that they yeah. even had a grouping. That obviously, that at some stage, there must have been some recognition uh, that having some kind of collective engagement was useful. Yeah, I think the history of the LDD is that it started as a group outside the Law Society and some people organised it informally 
And then when the Law Society was bringing these different groups within it, mm -hmm. um, so there was there was a women's group, an LGBT plus group, etc. Um, they were asked to join, so they they came within the Law Society. Um, sometimes the people within it say maybe we would prefer to be independent to be quite honest mm. but then they don't get access to those yeah. roots of power yeah, yeah it's a tough one but at least as I say it's a, it's a special interest group it's yeah. there it gets le legitimacy alongside some of the other underrepresented groups so you partnered with them we partnered with them and during the process of our research actually something called the disabled lawyers association set up as a result of our research and that was amongst the barristers who also opened it up to students of law and solicitors and anyone who wants to join it. Oh, basically. brilliant. How exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we gave birth to this group, which was really nice because um, they credit us with, with having inspired them to do it. Um, and yeah, we got together with this group and we thought we, what we really wanted was, was this to be research that was shaped from the bottom up. Yep. And in a way that was helpful. It was helpful that both myself and Natasha hadn't been in the legal profession ourselves. I was an academic and she'd worked as a researcher and with the TUC, but neither of us had that much knowledge of law. And so we met with the Lawyers with Disabilities Division and they said, um, well, why don't you hold some focus groups and see people's issues that really concern them? So we did, we, we, we held eight focus groups across England and Wales because that part of the Law Society only covers England and Wales. Yeah. It's got, yeah. It's got its own Law Society. And um, we had a range of people turning up, uh, some really, really interesting discussions. The Bar Council also organised some discussions for us within their premises. And from, from those dis discussions, those eight um, meetings we drew up a list of questions that we would ask in semi-structured and unstructured interviews some of them became unstructured uh because they went on i found out that lawyers can really talk yeah well <laughs> they, they are funny about that they can but you know what and we talked about this before we started recording because actually what often happens is there's a lack of opportunity for people to engage in conversation you know yeah. so so they're probably you know you 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 and your team rock up and 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 there's this outpouring of things that people oh, yeah. have kind of been cogitating over for years and they need to talk about it and there's a as you say there's kind of a richness and I think that's the oh, nice thing about the semi-structured method. Amazing data. Exactly, exactly. But what a catalyst people, for change yeah, already, you know. Yeah, lots of people said this was the first time they'd ever talked about this in their life. And some people wrote to us afterwards and said it was like a therapy session and it yeah. had changed the way they looked at the world, which was really, really fulfilling, you know, that you'd had this conversation. And I, I think that the fact that, we were disabled researchers as well we both went into this and we we could bring our lived experience to the interview and talk about you know well this is this has been my experience at work experience has been was really you know helpful and the interviews lasted none of them were under an hour most of them were up to three hours wow um, wow <laughs> <laughs> and uh we just had a huge amount of data but some really really interesting insights so we transcribed all that and once we started looking at data we thought well that this is great one of the one of the issues that the law society has brought up was have you got any statistics now i'm a qualitative researcher and Originally, I sort of said, no, but we're, you know, we've got lots of data here, qualitative data, and we do, do some case studies, if you like, and, you know, if you want some case study material, and they're going, oh, yeah, but what about the headline statistics? And I thought, well, okay, we'll do a survey. So we, we did two surveys, in fact, because we found that the barristers had slightly different issues yeah, from sure. the mm. to the solicitors and the paralegals. So we did a survey for the solicitors and paralegals and we did a survey for the barristers and we got up to 300 responses from that. So then we were able to have some, I mean, you, neither of us were crunk. massive statisticians, but we had some headline statistics. At the start, you know, and, and so you can get some crunch it down. And, and I imagine, yeah. you know, even the kind of narrative, um, you know, qualitative work that you were doing, I mean, it, this is like a, a rich 
which data set and yeah. um, I mean there's all I guess uh, you're probably still in the process of kind of really I know you've published material out of it but it, imagine the multi levels of unpacking yeah. uh, the issues yeah. I mean you talked about the fact that many people um, it was the first time they had spoken about these issues that in itself I think there I must say from my own experience there is something to be said even if you don't know about the field about having disabled researchers are uh, uh, you know because there is this kind of I mean often people will say look you know you're not like ethnic groups because you don't have these kind of you know cultural synergies and that you know um, you know people's experience of disability uh, varies but actually there are threads of solidarity of kind of yeah. reson resonance that means that sometimes the questions that you'll ask and or you respond to uh, and their responses is there's probably an opening up um, yeah. of issues in yeah, ways definitely. that may not happen if you had someone from outside coming in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what, how did you pull that together? So in terms of uh, what do you think the major findings, I mean, if you could get a snapshot of the, the, the kinds of common issues, you, you mentioned that barristers issues obviously were quite different from uh, solicitors. Do you use the word solicitors in yeah, Wales? Yeah. 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 Some of them were different and some of them weren't. I mean, a lot of the barristers, the differences were to do with um, performance yeah. within yeah. their job. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of putting forward yourself and performing in, in a court context um, that's involved with barristers. And also a lot of the, the chambers aren't accessible because yeah. Of, yeah. of historic buildings. Yeah. That Old buildings, been. yeah. 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 And, and, you know, the whole thing about going to court, you said about the big books that you had to read, the big law books, and the amount of times that people said, you know, every court has a, a, a set of steps and there's no way of getting in there via a lift often. Um, very, very basic things. There was yeah, no yeah, assumption. Yeah, there was an assumption that the litigant or the defendant was disabled or could be disabled yeah, but there yeah. was never an assumption yeah. that the advocate would yeah. be disabled yeah well that goes back to a really important issue without getting overly theoretical is the idea of ableism because you've got this idea about who is the authoritative person under yeah. an ableist kind of logic and usually obviously it's a white middle-aged male who's able-bodied and obviously women have had to challenge that you know there's been discussions over the years about what women should wear as lawyers as barristers you know yeah. the whole presentation of self and should they act like she men um yeah. that kind of thing and and we don't have that we don't have that kind of modeling about having this kind of authoritative mastery because let's face it being a barrister is being a persuasive advocate um, yeah. who knows all and can kind of um, direct the emphasis of the case and can kind of um, marshal all the evidence and is telling a story, the whole idea of an authoritative storyteller. So I imagine that would have been quite uh, interesting to, yeah. to kind of explore and how, what strategies maybe, if any, the barristers use to disarm uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe any potential kind of uh, challenges to that authoritativeness. Yeah. 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 I remember an interview with um, one who uh, was a criminal barrister and he said, I, I represent murderers and rapists and they really don't care that I'm in a wheelchair. The only people that care are the, the other barristers and the judges. They're the ones that seem to care. The, the, you know, the, the actual defendants couldn't care less. They just want to know that I can do my job. Yeah. And, I, um, yeah. 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 And I yeah. think I, th I think they're right. I mean, I've not been in that situation, but I recently was involved in a project where I was interviewing disabled people in jail and yeah. um, around social care needs. And um, it, again, it made such a difference. It wasn't articulated in an explicit way, but, you know, coming in as a wheelchair user, um, I mean, obviously there's suspicions about researchers, but you were kind of seen as a comrade, yeah. <laughs> a rather awkward comrade, because I was actually uh, uh, interviewing sexual offenders. So I don't know really how comradely I actually wanted to be, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> but, but um, so what, and, and so with the solicitors, what kinds of issues came out for them? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think the research sort of divided up into getting into the profession and then getting on and getting up into the profession 
it, it divided that way for, for everybody who went into the profession, really, whether there were solicitors, paralegals or barristers. But it seemed that the solicitors in particular were using routes that um, use, for example, um, recruitment agencies. A lot of organisations, uh, recruitment, which we found was quite interesting because they would invested heavily in these, these diversity and inclusion initiatives yeah. within their organisations. And you've got the big city firms who really wanted to project an image of inclusiveness. Oh, absolutely. And then at that, and then at that really basic level of getting into the profession, you know, just getting your first training contract, getting your first job or work experience, they were contracting it all out to private um, recruitment agencies who didn't have a clue about inclusive. Yeah. So we had loads of people saying that recruitment agencies were a real problem and that you know, they would um, phone up and be told that there were lots of opportunities that could be arranged and if they were disabled or a wheelchair user, it was, oh no, you know, that those opportunities, no, no, I didn't do it. actually they're not there. And, you know, we had descriptions of, it, you could hear the tumbleweed going down the street to be disabled and they needed reasonable adjustments. Um, people, you know, when, when we did the survey, when we were doing the interviews, we picked up on this. And when we did the survey, we had a result of 9.7% of those people surveyed said they had a positive experience right. with recruitment agencies. Right. I mean, I so think, you know, you know, you've you read it. Yeah, no, you've raised a really important issue because, as you say, a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, businesses, including universities, uh, outsource uh, particularly senior appointments to recruitment agencies. And you know, yeah. I, I must say, I wonder particularly with senior appointments, about why they're not getting women applicants, for example, coming through. Um, why they're not getting, you know, black and brown ac applicants coming through, and obviously disabled applicants. So, I mean, it seems like they are an important conduit as part of the, uh, you know, uh, inclusive hiring practices. And yeah. um, it sounds like your research pointed to the fact that maybe a lot more work needs to be done with these people because they're the ones yeah. that are doing the gatekeeping. They're doing the gatekeeping, yeah. And even if you can get into law, then getting on is another problem because there's no one like you. I mean, this came up time and time again. People said in interviews, I don't see anyone like me at the top. I don't see role models. I don't see mentors. I don't see a yeah. promotion criteria that is allowing me to say, well, I can do a lot of that, that particular activity, but I can't do very much of something else. And so promotion criteria actually as a bunch of people, you know, in the legal profession, some of whom were employment lawyers, they had never actually thought about asking for a reasonable adjustment in the promotion criteria. That came as a kind of ping. <laughs> no. no, well, that's oh, wow. That's that. wow. I mean, you said a couple of really powerful things, and this is why this work is so important. One is, um, the importance of mentoring and role models and again because you know uh, disabled people aren't seen as a collective entity in the way that for example you know race and and uh, you know sex-based rights might be um, and you know lots of work have been done about you know women mentoring women and yeah. BAME people mentoring BAME people um, and but and this is this whole individualization issue and the medicalization issue because actually if you see disabled people as a class and a class can include you know heterogen heterogeneous uh, yeah. perspectives and experiences and disabilities but um, I think so. As somebody, for example, you know, in Australia, we in higher education, um, you know, only 3.5% of disabled people go to university, let alone become academics. Um, and, and the absence yeah. of, 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 of people around you, even just to have a coffee to say, how did you deal with this? But also what the second part of your finding, which is, I think, really interesting is the uh, uh, I mean, maybe they didn't use the language, but that kind of internalization of ableism that says, you know what, uh, not I, I have to do twice as good or three times as much yeah. and that kind of issue of surveillance. So you don't, even though, as you say, with these employment lawyers, they know about reasonable adjustments, um, 
hopefully then they know a wee bit about equalities law but yeah. there is still that tape recorder about special rights and special treatments so it just doesn't yeah. dawn on you to make that link with yourself that what do i need to have in terms of reasonable adjustments to level the playing field for myself yeah, yeah. And I think COVID-19 is going to be quite interesting because the one thing we found was the most resisted reasonable adjustment was homeworking. And, right. you know, this, this being wedded to presenteeism in the office, being seen on a day to day basis, um, you know, being present uh, yeah. seems to be a really big theme that came out. Um, I, I mean, I, I found some of the working practices just archaic. Yeah, can you, uh, can you can you talk about that a bit more? And I'm really interested also hearing about it, did any issues come up with experiences of co-workers as well? Um, there weren't too many issues with co-workers, but I, I was thinking about the performance management systems that are generally used in larger practices, yeah. not so much in small firms. But billable hours, you know, this this concept of as an academic, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking this is a really service orientated industry you know client orientated industry um but they're quantifying people's input and performance in terms yeah, of yeah. billable hours it's just kachung you know the money what about the service relationship what about you know all the other things that go no, with it that's a common trend can i say to you in the, there, there isn't an equivalent profession in the uk but i used to teach rehabilitation counselors or vocational rehabilitation counselors and they also use that model of yeah. billable, billable hours and it's a real yeah. problem yeah and i mean we we constantly put it to organizations we spoke to that this this just builds in a substantial disadvantage for disabled people a lot of disabled people not it may not be all but quite a lot and therefore you know it, it's an ableist practice it's, and, and yeah. it's ultimately discriminatory but the thing you were saying about the internalization I think that's that's interesting as well because we we also found something called um, w which we called misplaced paternalism. Yeah, lovely. Which meant yeah. which meant that a lot of people um, would you know be the disabled person in the firm, uh, and you know maybe they'd have a period of rehabilitation or time off work because they'd gone for some treatment. They come back, and there's their nice line manager. <laughs> not the nasty one the nice one the nice line manager would decide to give them the most most unchallenging work oh my god which which means that you know not only are they then feeling undervalued because they're not being challenged in any way but all the promotion criteria that they need is is taken away from them yeah i was just going to so ask you about what the impact does on, on career per progression because it's yeah. a it's a very uh competitive environment yeah. uh, you know lawyers tend to work long hours how, you know how, did, how what kind of responses did you get to the those issues about this uh miss i love it misplaced paternalism yeah. I wonder, <laughs> it, I, i'm interested in that because is it misplaced I, I how did you what was your thinking around how this worked I, I, well, we, we, we came a lot, across a lot of people who had line managers who were not at all supportive. Um, and it was a case of, well, you know, you went, came into the profession, you knew that it was long hours culture, you knew it was presenteeism, so what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So you fit into our model. We're not going to adapt a job for you. This is, this is an ableist model. You fit into it, and if you can't, then tough. So then we got examples of people for example there was um one lawyer who had a progressive hearing impairment and he had become a partner in the firm and um, done very well uh, and his hearing degenerated over time and he kind of tried to conceal it and manage it himself yeah, but yeah. it just got too problematic mainly with the the events where he was having to uh do lots of networking yeah, which was a big feature of the legal profession, That's bringing right. money and yep. networking with clients, and he found that increasingly difficult. So you know, he 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 decided to confide in HR and his line manager, and it was only during the interviews when we were interviewing him that um, we began probing his decision because his decision was that he would take a kind of step back. He would do a sorry a, a step down yep. from partner yep. into a slightly different role 
which they had kind of created for him. Um, however, while we were talking to him, he suddenly, it's like a light bulb went up in yeah. his head. Yeah, another one of those moments. Realized, yeah. Yeah. He realised, actually, he'd been shafted. He'd been shafted out oh, of his totally role. Oh, totally con, totally con. Totally yeah. con out of his role. And he was an equity partner, so he'd lost his, his earnings for the future. But yeah. they'd been doing him a favour, you know, because they'd given him this created role that wasn't really a role at all. And it was very, very unchallenging. And he'd actually, he was talking about at that point on his own and setting up his own business, you know, because he, he actually, while he was being interviewed, you could see that, you know, he realised he dropping. had. Yeah, the penny dropping. And was that a, like, I mean, obviously that's a great, um, you know, example to use. Was that, was that a common experience do you think of um this this misplaced term paternalism uh this kind of and it's interesting uh actually Shri Razak who's a um a, a geographer lawyer in a very different research context talks about this idea of creation of anomalous zones so it sounds like this would kind of apply in some ways these kind of irregular or special spaces or it might be special tasks yeah. That are created in the process of lawyering. Was that, I mean, was this quite a common thing that came up in different ways? And uh, and it's, and I'm wondering about, again, coming back to the process of doing the research, because, I mean, to what extent were people self-aware or, or yeah. and, but, but others obviously became self-aware in the process of well, probing, probing these either. issues. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, it was common, but it was also that, for example, I'm thinking of somebody I interviewed who was re recently retired, yep. and he'd yep. been a partner in a firm in Cardiff, in fact, and he'd been there for 30 years, very, very senior, and in the course of talking to him, he was a really nice bloke, and he said, you know, well, I eventually was, I got a sight impairment, and I was eventually um, finding it more and more difficult to go into the office. So I arranged to work from home, but felt very guilty about that. It was like a um, disciplining yourself, a self-discipline, you know, that, that because, and I said, did it make any difference? Could you, could you actually communicate with your team? Were you yeah. still managing that team? Was the performance of the team? They said, well, it was, but you know, I, I felt it was awkward. And, and, after we spoke, he actually wrote me a very long email and he said, after this conversation today, I realised that I shouldn't have taken early retirement. I should have insisted on staying on and being a disability role model and a mentor because I was in a very, very senior position. And he said, but I don't actually think it was all my colleagues. Some of it was me that yeah, I felt wow. that I had to leave the organisation. Yeah, yeah. Nobody actually explicitly said to me that I was underperforming or not bringing in enough money or anything like this. And I think that that's, that's interesting, that interaction of the everyday ableism that you end up internalising. Um, I think Donna Reeve talks about socio-emotional disabledism. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and that's, look, you know, this is a, I mean, it'd really be great to kind of, you know, uh, maybe even because you've got that lovely rich data set to, to focus on that because this is about the interaction. I mean, this is about subjectivity. It's about um, actually, and we don't talk about this because maybe it's seen as a moral issue i'm not sure like there's a moral judgment but actually often we are involved in that process of self-sabotage uh yeah. you know because we've got that tape recorder in our background and there's these complex voices and conversations happening uh i mean you know again the nearest i can get to that might be around women and the imposter syndrome that's yeah. been spoken about and written about you know um different kind of um uh, what's the word takes on the idea uh, but but there is that thing about pardon me for breathing I don't want to make trouble I don't want to draw attention to myself um, and but but at, at, at one hand I mean again that's why I think it would be an interesting to look at maybe some of the people who raise this issue yes there is the kind of self-sabotage and as you point out maybe people weren't being told explicitly that you know maybe you yeah. should resign or demote yourself or whatever or take on a tokenistic task but i do think that there is this kind of uh 
and this is a hyp hypothesis, I guess, is this, is this, in terms of ableist relations, people do know, they do know that's going on. There's a dynamic huh? happening. Uh, people know they don't have to, I'm talking about the other people now, um, don't know, they know they don't have to be explicit about this because it, it's kind of like, you know, the elephant in the room. We know what's kind of going on. I mean, it's a bit like, what do they say? If you have a, 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 a an employee that you don't like or doesn't go along with the management style, you don't have to um, uh, necessarily sack them, although some people do get sacked. Um, there are processes that natural attrition can take place. <laughs> you know, what do we say? What we say in Australia is there's more than one way to skin a cat. Oh, I never understood that expression, the poor cat. But do you know what I mean? Like that, like there's different ways of kind of um, uh, getting people to self question. I mean, it, is, it sounds like yeah. it's in full form of gaslighting in some ways. It doesn't yeah. have to be as, but not so explicit because. People are, I mean, Foucault talks about this. We are, we work on ourselves. We, yeah. you know, this, this kind of, we don't need That's someone with it. We, yeah. yeah, we don't need the brick bat. We, we, we actually do it to ourselves. Yeah. Um, so that would be really interesting. And what's really interesting from you, what I'm hearing you saying is the profound impact that this research has had. Each of them have either, either had the aha moment in the interview or like with the person that you were talking about then, that um, yeah. he, he'd reflected upon that and it was so important that he decided to to write you yeah. an email. Did you respond to that email, by the way? Yeah, so I, I did. And he, you know, he offered his services in future if there was anything he could do. Um, and I also think it was um interesting that we we had some questions in 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 the survey the later survey about ill treatment in the workplace and i've worked with some people in social sciences at Cardiff, and um some of his colleagues they did some works a couple of years ago about ill treatment in the workplace and they didn't call it discrimination right. because they found that when they particularly asked disabled people if they'd been discriminated against, they said no. But if they then described certain forms of ill treatment and bullying behaviour that would actually amount to a form of discrimination, most disabled people said yes to that. Yeah, yeah. So they were quite interested in that finding. Now, I was interested in using that on lawyers who might know a little bit more about discrimination law. Yes. And would they come up with a similar thing? Yeah. They actually describe it as discrimination or would they describe it as a form of ill treatment? And most of them actually did the same and described it as a form of ill treatment rather than a form of discrimination. Yeah, uh, no, that's interesting. That's that hierarchy, yeah. hierarchy of uh, injustice, isn't it? But but also it's like discrimination. It has particular kind of uh, buzzwords as an authenticity of troubles. But, you know, that's yeah. really interesting that they were still seeing it as ill treatment. Maybe yeah. it wasn't, was, again, wasn't maybe bad enough to be seen as legal discrimination. Well, what was also interesting was there was quite a difference between the solicitors and the paralegals and the barristers. So the kinds of ill treatment that barristers were describing were really overt. They were name calling. Yes. Demeaning. In Unbelievable. Front of client, you know, really, really hostile, overt, yeah. Yeah. discriminatory behaviour, which when we discussed it with the Bar Council and the Bar Standards Board, they kind of went, we're not really surprised. No, it's like that's, a military culture, isn't it? That, I mean, that's it's, the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the culture. Very, it's very militaristic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, the solicitors and the paralegals were talking about instances that were much more subtle. Right. And why do you think there was a difference with the uh, uh, solicitors and paralegals? Have you got any thoughts about that? Or is it... Well, just the, mainly the culture of the, the professions and the competitiveness within it. But, right. um, why Be interesting, wouldn't it? Overt, no, I no. Well, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, kind of to follow up that issues. So I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, bring it together. I mean, I, I, we must get you back for another interview and look at some components of this because this is so rich. I mean, what we can do um, when we upload the videos, we'll put some links. I'll get you to send me some links. So we'll put some links to the papers for people um, yeah. and contact details because part of the issue is, uh, firstly, you know, 
looking at the research, looking in detail, which we can't do in this interview with your findings, but again, to kind of tease, tease out the issues. Um, where, where, so where to next with the, uh, with the work that you're doing in this area? I mean, do you, are there particular areas you think that need more work yeah sounds, sounds like there's well, stacks of areas but areas that particularly jump out yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but something we're doing now which is um with the law society since since we did the research we had a conference and then yep. during lockdown we've been doing uh, a number of round tables with yep. the dni team at the law society so we did seven or eight round tables with them and we got more than 100 different people participate wow from all sorts of areas of the legal profession joined in uh, and they also organized just before lockdown a, a president's dinner at the law society because they'd never had a president's dinner about disabled lawyers before oh very snazzy i would have loved to have gone to that i know that okay. they're, they're, i mean they're very regal <laughs> regal regal events but that is actually know, quite, that is so symbolic it is symbolic Yes. And the president of the Law Society at the moment is someone from Clifford Chance, which is right. one of the big magic circle firms in the city. Uh -huh. and, and a lot of city firms tend to follow each other. So we were hoping for some kind of, you know, I don't know, way of getting the, the message out there and getting yeah. people to actually read it. Yeah. Uh, so we, we had we had those uh, the the the, um, the conference was great as well because the feedback yeah. we got from disabled people coming to the conference was so incredibly positive. Yeah. People, you know, getting in touch and just saying you can't tell I can't tell you how much this meant to me to have a conference like yeah. this. Yeah. With being organised by disabled people for disabled people oh. in the profession. They said that this had never happened to them before oh. and they'd met loads of people that yeah. they contacted yeah. and deeply personal deeply yeah. political i mean this is why you know you seriously debbie this is why your work is just so important because and the others i know you were doing it as part of a team because you may not feel the effects the rippling effects this is seismic um, and it's a healing piece of research. I imagine the opportunity yeah. for people to talk about this um, means that there's a gap. Uh, we're bridging that gap between maybe that dissonance that's occurring. And uh, I think that's yeah. profoundly important. And the, the, the bit of, we've got a little bit of research going on at the moment. We're about to launch a survey with the Law Society in conjunction with them on the experiences of disabled people um, in their work during COVID-19. Okay, that sounds good. And, and this is to challenge that that ingrained resistance within the law mm -hmm. or within the legal sector mm -hmm. of people working remotely. Yeah, because that's it, important. It, it came up as the most refused reasonable adjustment, but the most yeah. requested reasonable adjustment. Yeah. So you're getting the evidence base, and it sounds like you've fallen in love with surveys too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But, but, it, but it is, isn't it? It's kind of like, I mean, I think that's actually, I mean, that's an issue that's also been used, um, you know, by universities as well. Yeah. And we need to get kind of like, well, you know, literally like drilling down um, to what people do, how they do it. Um, uh, yeah. and, and, and the survey will be great. And also looking at the possibilities that working at home has provided that maybe have not been available in the past because we're getting yeah. that deficit model that somehow it's... um less efficient but um uh you know and but it would be good to get some experiences from disability side of it because we yeah. know i mean you and i know our souls in terms of our own work i mean while it while i mean we're having this interview now we're we're in conferences and whatever but there is something draining also about the virtual environment so how that kind of rubs up against particular kinds of disabilities would be interesting yeah. to find out in terms of them doing their job as lawyers or barristers you know yeah, and I think the, the thing about COVID that was different was that it wasn't disabled people asking to just be working at home. Everybody was having to do it. And the fact that we were all involved in this unique project, you know, didn't matter who you were, what status you were, whether you were, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it didn't yeah. matter. You, I mean, there's good... all participating in it. Well, that's right. And I think there's a good piece of, uh, piece of research by, uh, I think his name was Bagwat. Anyway, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but I mean, it was an American uh, lawyer 
<coughs> pardon me, uh, a researcher. And the point there, and, and his article is about reasonable accommodations, which is what they use in the US as the language, yeah. um, uh, was that in fact, reasonable accommodations are already being made to senior management. Uh, I mean, yeah. I think the whole idea that kind of where, again, the special rights, uh, the kind of disability is exceptionalism. Uh, you know, we, we, we know, in fact, this is being done. Um, and as you say, that the, the, there's a change in the power dynamics here with COVID because it wasn't us saying, please, 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 can we have this exceptional kind of thing? Uh, everybody's doing it. Um, it would be, I mean, the importance of your research will be significant because one of the things that I've been having discussions with people about is actually uh, seeing disabled people's knowledge as a contribution because actually, yeah. what, you know, what's worked for us? I mean, we are the carriers because we have been the carriers of exceptionalism. Uh, we've had to develop these strategies like of working at home or working, uh, dealing with the isolation and all these yeah. kinds of, uh, even anxiety. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to paint a picture of us all being anxious, but the fact is we've, I've, I've always said that with ableism, if you haven't got depression, you, you know, you'll get it later because it's, uh, ableism is deadly, the day-to-day, -day, you know, kind of um, yeah. incursion. So, so we, yeah, yeah. So we've got, so we've actually got lots to, to, to offer. Um, and yeah. that will be a great Definitely. finding of that research. Um, so that's great. So keep us in touch with that. Um, and so we'll put the links to the paper. I think we probably should draw this a little bit to a close. I mean, I just, um, maybe just one more question. In If you were re reflecting upon this, what do you think was the most surprising? I mean, you talked about some surprises today, but a, a, a surprising thing that you didn't anticipate at all with this research. Maybe that's being a bit naughty to put you on the spot to narrow it down, but was there something that really struck you as some? Um... Um, I think it was the role of an academic doing this research, um, bringing it back to the academy. But I think, or quite a lot surprising actually, was the reaction I got from quite a lot of colleagues mm -hmm. and other academics who, when I said I was doing something on disabled people in the legal profession, immediately they said, oh yes, um, disabled clients. And I said, no, <laughs> no. These are disabled people working in the legal profession. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listeners, judges, barristers. Yeah, yeah. And they immediately, and when I went to look at an impact case study for this because the impact should be huge drill yes. was a project disability yeah. research for independent living and learning was a project about co-production exactly and bringing disabled people into the research and them benefiting from yes. this research yes if you can't get impact out of that what could you get impact out of but trying to persuade a group of academics that that represents impact. I actually got a review from an anonymous reviewer who I think was from a law school, <laughs> that said, so what? What sort of impact is this research making? It's very nice for the disabled people, but who else benefits? Yeah, yeah. And this is not, a, not being used as an impact case study. And that's right. that something about the production of knowledge. We talked about the production of knowledge when women were excluded from the academy, and uh, we look at our history, and it's all gendered, yeah. it's all racialized. Yeah. yeah. We look back at that, and we don't actually apply this to disabled people. No, I agree, and I think there's a, 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 a and that is a big finding because actually we need to change the knowledge power relations and how we work. I mean, co-production is not understood. I mean, some people are talking about it, but again, not at the level of yeah. depth. Um, but, you know, the importance, and it is hard. I mean, I'm currently working on a grant bid at the moment, and we've done some preparatory work um, around that, and it's hard. It's, if you really talk about, for example, disabled people or the other group, because this is actually not a disability project, becoming part of the governance team of a research project, yeah. be, uh, you know, recognising their skills, but also recognising their gaps, so training them up to be researchers yeah. uh, alongside partnering with us, that is... Um, very time consuming it's, it's time consuming it's challenging but you know what it's it, 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 it's 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 again maybe we'll do another interview around that and get a round table actually it would be really good to get yeah. a round table interview about that because it uh, the visual image that comes to me debbie is uh, the passing on of the baton like really yeah. um 
you know, it, it's it's recognising we do have privilege, and you and I, as disabled women professors, I mean, we are a rare breed for a start, but we do have privilege, and it's about how can we enable um, other people? But also, I mean, even afterwards, I mean, you've, you've had a team of people you were training up that were coming on with a, in a co-productive way. It raises their expectations too about where mm. to next. Um, yeah. But I think, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that we need to, to also uh, send back to the REF people as well, is yeah. this idea, and I know there are discussions around REF and disability at the moment, um, but, but this idea of an inclusive uh, concept of impact conceptually. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the conceptual work's done, hopefully, then the the practice and the policy and the guidance. But I mean, I, I think the other thing that you said, and you know, it drives me nuts. Maybe I'm getting old. I don't know. It's um, uh, no, cause I've had a disability since 1981. You see these kind of things go round and round, you know, two yeah. steps forward, four backwards. And you know, Dirksen in 1980 was a Canadian rehabilitation person talked about the kind of charity ethic and you know, that disabled people always seen as the users, the receiver, yeah. receivers of services and all the rest were these nice kind of, um, providers and I must say one of my big shocks of coming to the UK is uh, was how dominant the charity ethic is I mean you know you you register as a charity but here we have the charity ethic yeah. automatically in people's minds people are seeing disability as recipients yeah and they're kind of oh it's very nice for the disabled people how nice for them but how does this show academic impact oh god well i hope you're keeping a straight face at the time this was <laughs> happening but on a good note so that that would be good to kind of i mean again there's lots of unintended um uh, results of this research and, and um it would be good to kind of like um uh, because i think that whole issue about knowledge production um, yeah, 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 and what happens to the people afterwards? I mean, again, we're probably yeah. running, we're running out of time now. But that research team that you had, what happens after that? Because I say the yeah. raise of raising of expectations. Are they involved in? Yeah, project? well, you see these round tables we did. We did these seven or eight round tables, and now we've recorded the actual presentation of the data. Right. And now the LDD are going to go off and run all their own round tables. Brilliant. Within, within the the Law Society, right. brilliant, brilliant. Law Society, okay, with our video at the front, and then yeah. they're going to have their own discussion and feedback, right? Wow, so, wow. So, the, so they've they've got you know they ne they were never covered in the Law Gazette, and now they get an article every month from the yeah. Law Gazette. Um, it's leading the DNI research within the Law Society at the moment, yeah, for the years and all the other. All the other protected cats yeah, characteristics yeah. Are trying to replicate what yeah, they're doing yeah. so they feel really really empowered yeah, and that's yeah. that's how we wanted it to be well that's good and that's a good note to close off on i mean the research has lit the spark and lit multiple sparks in a whole lot of unexpected areas and i think again to use that kind of analogy of passing on the baton yeah. uh, that's happening so look it's been great talking with you about this and um well done and as i said we will uh, put the links up to some papers and um yeah. keep the conversation going and thank you it's uh it's been um uh really exciting talking to you brilliant thank you thanks for inviting me